Well, good morning again, Written and Grace Brethren Church. So good to be back. Last week was uh, really great with having former Pastor Mike Prenovich here, so it's hard, hard to follow that, but I'm going to do my best. We are continuing in a uh, sermon series that we've been in, uh, looking at the life of David. So um, if you're a Bible person, my guess is you might be a little bit familiar uh, with David. David was a shepherd. The Bible tells us he was also a hymn writer. Uh, we see that. He wrote the psalm, some of the psalms. And we're learning about this man that the Bible tells us was a man after God's own heart. And so I always like to say, if you're just now jumping in with us in this study on the life of David, you're actually catching us towards the end. We're on week number nine, if you can believe it, week number nine of an 11-week uh, series. So we're kind of closing in towards the end now. And I just want to encourage you, if you missed any of the past weeks uh, in this series in David, you can go to RittmanGrace.org and access all the past week messages as well as our other sermon series as well. I encourage you to do that. But the way I want to uh, start today's message, I actually want to ask you a question. Have you ever felt like you just don't belong? Has there ever been a time in your life where you felt like you just don't belong? I can tell you, I remember being invited to church when I was 22 years old. I'm 32 years old now, so if, you, if, if I do the math right, which I'm really not good at math, I was, uh, you know, that's 10 years now, so 32 today. 22 years old, I was invited to church. Before that time, I hadn't been to church since I was 14 years old. So I was a little bit nervous to go to church. And I remember thinking to myself, in fact, I remember sitting in my car in that church parking lot and thinking, what if I don't fit in? What if I don't speak the right lingo? What if they know about my past? I've got a really bad past. What if they know some of the bad things that I've done? What if I'm not wearing the right clothes? What if I'm underdressed? What if they see my car, which at the time was a 2002 Ford Taurus, pretty rusty around the wheel wells. What if they see that car next to their really nice cars? I'm going over all these what if scenarios in my head because I'm worried that I'm not going to fit in. And I'm worried that I'm not going to be accepted. I'm worried that I'm not going to belong. So I mentioned that to you this morning because sometimes I think we have the wrong view of church. We can think that it's supposed to be this sterile environment where we keep the sickness outside and we keep the disease outside as if the church is just a pure location. Back in the 1970s, there was a television show called MASH. And my guess is some of you might be familiar with this show. It was before my time, but I've seen the reruns. And basically, MASH is, uh, is a show about this mobile army surgical hospital where illness and injury were treated right inside. Now, when you were triaged and you were treated and you were recovering within this mobile army surgical hospital, I think the church is supposed to look a lot like MASH, uh, as funny as that might sound, because that's where community comes in. That's where church community comes in. It allows us to be uh, able to heal. It allows us to be able to grow, and it allows us to learn about ourselves and others and our relationship with God. I think sometimes we can operate under a false assumption of what a Christian looks like. Typically, it's a really lousy stock photo of a happy family. And for whatever reason, you know, we might think to ourselves, I just don't fit that mold. Maybe for you, you're, you're single. Maybe you don't have children. Maybe you've been divorced or separated. Or maybe based on some of the choices in your life that you've just felt shamed by the church. Or maybe you know somebody that feels that way. If you've been looking on the outside wondering, you know, is church for me? Is community for me? You're one of the people that I hope this sermon reaches this morning. And then for others of us, maybe you're in another camp, and you know, there's people who are part of the church, and you feel like you belong. And you're wondering, Pastor Clark, what are you talking about? This is my church, and I'm excited to grow by the learning of God's living word. My hope is that for you, if, if you're in that camp, that you're reminded of your position in the kingdom of God, in his family, and in the church. And then lastly, there's 
some of us that have been part of church community, but then they've just decided that community is not for them. Over this past season of COVID and the lockdowns, we got a little bit comfortable with our new routines. The rugged individualist who says, I come to church, I watch church. Back in Bible college, we used to call that the bedside Baptist. You think, I come to church, I watch church, but I don't need community on a day-to-day basis. So maybe for you, you know, I hope you're encouraged to see where community is right now and where community might be come this fall when we start up some biblical community ministries that my hope is you'll plug into. Because the Bible calls us to speak the gospel, the good news, how God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die an atoning sacrificial death for our sins. And conquering Satan, sin, and death, we're invited into that victory as well so that we can find a newness of life and speak that truth into one another's lives. Well, what am I talking about? Well, today's sermon titled, sermon is titled, The Shocking Surprise of God's Grace. I think that's exactly what we're going to see in our text this morning. So I want to invite you, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9, we're actually technically at chapter 19, but we have to go back to chapter 9 to get the full picture of a character that we're going to be introduced to this morning, whose name is Mephibosheth. And I know you want to say it, so everybody turn to your neighbor and say Mephibosheth. All right, if you butchered it, that's okay. I'm going to do it a lot. So that's the character we're introduced to today. And before we dive into our passage this morning, a little bit of background. At this point in the story, King David has become the king. And I think it's important for us to know and understand that there there were two traditions in ancient times when someone became the king. The first tradition is that of the family line. In ancient times... When you died, your oldest son would become the king. And that's what we see in this first part of 2 Samuel. Ishbosheth, which is another fun name to say, became king after Saul died. So think of it this way. This is kind of how my mind works. Think about the United Kingdom for a second. We have uh, the queen, and when, when she dies, right, when she would die, it would be Prince Charles would become the king. And then when he dies, Prince William would become the king. And then when he dies, uh, Prince Harry would become the king. So it's kind of this uh, idea of a a family line. But when Saul uh, was killed, that's that's not what we see happen. Uh, At this point, all of Saul's children have been overthrown, killed, and conquered. And so we have David as the king, which leads us to this second tradition. So the first tradition is that of a family line. The second tradition looks a lot like this. When a king was conquered and a non-family member became king, like David, there was a much darker tradition. And the king, in this case, would eliminate everyone in the king's family. Pretty dark. He would eliminate any challenges, any claims to the throne, and any potential revolts. So think of it this way. I think of it like a new executive office clean-out. Or think of it this way. When the new president of the United States come into, uh, comes in, in the staff, the staff becomes new. Uh, he gets a new cabinet. And the reason that is is because the president wants loyalty in his administration. But like I said, that's not what we see with David. In fact, we get this same response of humility. Rather than destroy the family of Saul, David chose to show kindness to his family because of the promise that he made with Jonathan. He said, the Lord shall be between me and you, between your offspring and my offspring. And that promise he made to Jonathan. So keep that in mind as we break into the verse 1 of chapter 9 of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, it says this. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I could show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Why does David say this? Well, it's because he's pointing back. 
He's pointing back to that covenant that we just talked about. And the answer is given, if you bounce down to verse 3, the answer is given. He says, the king, the king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit. Ziba, who is a servant of Saul, says to him, there is someone, there's the son of Jonathan, and that's our character of today, our star character Mephibosheth, and he's lame in both feet, the Bible says. And we learn that he's living far off as well. So here's a little bit of the backstory with Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan. He was also the grandson of King Saul. And the Bible tells us we learn that when he was five years old, when Mephibosheth was five years old, they heard that King Saul and Jonathan fell in battle, and the entire royal household fled. And the Bible says that Mephibosheth had a nurse, and when his nurse picked him up, in her run out of the palace, she dropped Mephibosheth. And it was said that he was thrown to the ground and maimed in both of his feet. And after that, he was unable to walk. It's an awful story. So Mephibosheth was literally carried to the land of Gilead, where he found refuge and protection. So we have David's covenant here fulfilled. He's subdued all the adversaries of Israel, and he begins to think about the family of Jonathan. And he finds out about the family of Mephibosheth, so he calls for him. Okay, so let's pause for a second. Try to put yourself in Mephibosheth's shoes for a second. Imagine you're Mephibosheth. You're now a grown son of Jonathan, and you're the only remaining member of King Saul. And the conquering king has called for you, and he is asking for you to come into his presence. So what do you think? In light of what we just talked about, in light of the king's traditions of wiping out entire families, you're sure at this point that you're coming in for destruction. And that's exactly what Mephibosheth thinks. Because notice in verse 6, it says, When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to to, to pay him with honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. So what I find here is that Mephibosheth's body matches his attitude. Mephibosheth's body matches his attitude. You know, there's an impending sword coming as you greet the new king. It's kind of what he's thinking. But here's where the story takes a turn. And it's unexpected. And it's really a great story. David says to him in verse 7 now, Don't be afraid, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? And now King David turns to Ziba, the servant of Saul, and notice what he says in verse 9. It says, Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for, and Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Verse 11, Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. So what we see here is one of those times where we get a picture of Christ and the Old Testament. And I hope you can see it as clear as I do. David shows grace. He's a merciful king. He's extending grace to someone who doesn't deserve it. In the character of Mephibosheth. And we see this picture of saved sinners, and that's us. We're the Mephibosheth in this story. So 
What we're going to do is focus the remaining of our time on Mephibosheth. And I want to show you this morning a before and after picture of Mephibosheth. So let's, let's look at this together. If you have your bulletin notes, let me walk us through this. The first thing I want us to notice is that Mephibosheth was lame. Mephibosheth was lame, not like he wasn't cool, but like he was disabled. He was crippled. Due to his fall, he was limited in his abilities. And we have that picture very clearly. We just read it. But consider at this point in history, he was unable to do anything for himself. He had to be carried everywhere, completely dependent on other people. And he was completely at their mercy. And he was limited in his disability. So let's talk about us now. Due to Adam's fall, we're limited in our abilities. We're very much like Mephibosheth at this point. All of our behavior leads to nothing. We have no good in us. The Bible tells us that we, we require the intervention of God. In fact, in Romans chapter 3, the Bible tells us that no one is righteous, not even one. No one understands or seeks for God. So Mephibosheth was lame. He was limited in his abilities. And we too are limited in our abilities. The second thing I want you to notice is that Mephibosheth was hiding. Mephibosheth was hiding. He knew who David was. And those around him knew who David was. And he was hiding. In fact, he didn't want to be found. Just like Adam in the garden. So we could say this about us. We don't seek God. Romans chapter 5 tells us that we are enemies of God. That's how we're referred to. And we know in our spirit that death comes after judgment. We're walking around with fear as enemies of God. And that's our position. Just like the position of Mephibosheth before King David. He's hiding and so are we. Thirdly, Mephibosheth was scared. Mephibosheth was scared. He knows the power, he knows the might, and he knows the sword of King David. David was very, very popular. He knew about David's judgment, and he knows that he doesn't stand a chance. In fact, he can't even stand. He's literally at the feet of David. And he's also at the mercy of David. So much so that he lowers himself so far to the ground, bowing before him. So we could say this about us. Our position before God is a position of confession and repentance. Repentance in the sense that I'm going to turn from this direction in my life and I'm going to turn and go the other way. We yield to God and we beg for mercy. We're just like Mephibosheth. And then fourthly, Mephibosheth calls himself a dead dog. Dogs were looked down upon in Israel. It'd be like the way we look at cats in Rittman. If you have a cat, I'll pray for you. But back in Bible times, they ate table scraps off the table. They don't get to sit at the table. And he claim, Mephibosheth claims the role of not a dog, but of a dead dog. So for us, our position before God is that we are dead without Christ. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, For the wages of sin is death, but the, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we are clearly the Mephibosheth in this story. Mephibosheth, he is lame, he's hiding, he's scared, he's dead. And without the loving kindness of David in his intervening, he is hopeless, he is helpless, and he's awaiting judgment. And he did nothing to be reconciled to David. Do you see the connection? Because we're the same. We're in the same boat. We are lame. We are hiding. We are scared. And we're dead. And without the loving kindness of God, we, are, we too are hopeless and helpless and awaiting judgment. And without God's intervention, we're lost. And yet God invites us. God calls us. God welcomes us, 
And God commands us to come and dine at his banquet table. And we're called to enjoy this feast before God. That's the before picture of Mephibosheth. Now let's look at the after picture together. And this will be a lot more encouraging. Number one, Mephibosheth was welcomed into David's family. Mephibosheth was welcomed into David's family. He ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. And it says that he ate at the king's table regularly. Some of your translations say continuously. So for us, what can we say? Through Christ, we are welcomed into God's family. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. I don't know about you, but that gets me so fired up in a good way. Children of God. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, equally encouraging, For you are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So like Mephibosheth, we are welcomed as children of God for those of us that put our faith and hope in Jesus Christ. Secondly, Mephibosheth was restored. Not only was he welcomed in with a position at the king's table, but he also inherited all of his father's and all of his grandfather's wealth, the land that belonged to them, as well as the produce on those lands. So for us, we could say this, that we are restored in Christ. We are restored in Christ. Uh, the Bible says in 2 it should say 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. So if you want to correct that, I think I accidentally put 16, but it should say 17. The Bible says that, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. Mephibosheth was restored, and through Jesus Christ, we too can be restored. And then thirdly, Mephibosheth remains lame. Mephibosheth remains lame. He remains lame in both feet. He's restored to this place of honor, but in a position that remains dependent on David. And I think this is, uh, at face value, that doesn't look encouraging, but here's the way I think about it. We are restored, but we're still dependent on the Lord. We are restored, but we're still dependent upon him. We have this perfect picture of Mephibosheth in our life. We remain dependent in the midst of our sin. That's why I'm so encouraged by this helpful information that Jesus gives us in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. So we are restored, but we are dependent upon him. Okay, so in light of that, what do you do with this message? Well, at the beginning of our time together, I mentioned to you, uh, I addressed an audience that could be asking this question, do I belong? Do I belong? And maybe for you, you're thinking this morning, this internet stock photo of a church just does not look like me. I don't fit that mold. And you're asking, do I belong? Because everybody looks like they got it all together at church. And I've got a lot of sin in my life. Well, can I just tell you, I think some of you really need to hear this this morning, that that's a lie. The idea that everybody's got it together at church and that you just have a lot of junk in your life you've got to work on, that's a lie. Don't believe that for a second. Because as Christians, we remain sinners. We remain lame just like Mephibosheth. We remain in need of God's help. We remain in need of the community's help in the midst of that, sin, that sinful life still. But what's so encouraging is that at the same time, we're not called to remain in sin. I love this quote by Tim Keller. He says it this way, God sees us as we are. He loves us as we are. And he accepts us as we are. But by his grace, he does not leave us as we are. Because here's the deal. As followers of Christ, we're to diligently fight back against our sin. Going against our idols, the things that we shift our hope to, 
which in today's society and today's culture, it is so easy to shift our hope to other things that are just pulling for our attention. Whether it's the things of this world or whether it's the behavior of religion, this performance mentality that I have to earn God's favor. When we shift our hope to those kinds of things, we're called to attack and crush our idols. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but Mephibosheth, his name in the Hebrew, it means smashing idols, which I don't know about you, but I think that's a really cool name for a band. So if you're looking for a band name, smashing idols. But that's what we're called to do. We're called to smash the idols in our life. And a lot of times that looks like turning a good thing into an ultimate thing. There's a lot of good things in our lives, but God is the number one ultimate thing in our life. For followers of Christ, Christ should be number one. So that's what we're called to do, to not remain lame, to not remain in sin, but to work hard against, work hard against 